Hello and welcome to our special edition of Down to Earth on the Inferno currently engulfing Australia. Crimson skies, lives lost and destroyed, wildlife scorched by flames, images that evoke the end of the world. This is Australia in 2020. Meanwhile, the fires continue to ravage and temperatures soar. Is Australia's experience a preview of the future? Over the next hour, we'll be bringing you first-hand accounts of the flames, as well as analysis from various experts, as well as activists and our very own journalists, to try to understand the amplitude of this human and environmental catastrophe. But first, let's take a moment to reflect on some of the most striking moments of these devastating fires. And that, and it's a very sarcastic brain. It, it, it comes through from one direction, and tomorrow it'll come through the back door and grab you from behind. Um, and just to, when you think you've got that under control, it'll turn around from the other direction and come in again. It, ro it just roared up the roared, roared up the street, and just a big. What you see is a massive fire. You would never stop it. They had fire bombing, everything. It just was out of control. Out of control. To lose everything, everything like this is just so cruel. So, so cruel. Their hands are really burnt. Um, some have burns their noses and their face. They've got a lot of singed fur, um, and a lot also have some um, uh, injuries to their lungs from breathing in the really, really um, hot gas from the fire. absolutely despicable and it's lack of empathy and doing absolutely nothing. This has to stop. We can't keep forgetting and pretending that climate change isn't real and that the planet isn't burning. Now, the Australian fires first caught a light back in September. Today, more than 150 are still burning across the country, mainly in the states of Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia, some of them joining forces to form what's known as mega blazes. Now, if there are five facts to keep in mind as the crisis enters its fifth month, it's that a total of 10 million hectares of bush, forest and parks have burned. That's more than three times that lost in last year's Amazon fires. The death toll stands at 27, including four firefighters. At least 100,000 people have been displaced. The results of this inferno producing 370 uh, tonnes of CO2, more than France's annual emissions in just a few months. In terms of wildlife, 1.3 billion animals have been killed, and that includes bird, reptiles and mammals, but not insects. And finally, a colossal amount of aid has been collected, $1.4 billion, most of it in just the last few weeks. 
Now, some of the most haunting images of these fires emerged from the town of Mallacoota in the southern state of Victoria. Residents described red flames like devil's tongues lapping around them as thousands found themselves trapped on the town's foreshore. Mary O'Malley was among those stranded along with her family and she joins us now from Sydney. Mary, many thanks for being with us. You're welcome. Now, you're right now, you're relatively safe in Sydney, but can you explain for us those harrowing hours as the fires swept by? Yes, I can. Um, we got, we went to a town meeting on December 30th, the day before, and my husband, who um, grew up in the town, happened to be chatting to one of the fireys, so... When he found out where our block of land was, he said, get out immediately. And I think at that stage, people thought we were being a bit melodramatic. So we set about for the next four hours packing up. We had to dig our caravan out, put wheels on, pack up our whole tent city. We had uh, my son and seven of his friends with us. Um, who, they were meant to be down for this Christmas celebration. We had to pack up everything and move it round to um, a place by the foreshore. And that's where we spent the next two days, basically. So um, on the, we were evacuated from that spot once again by the police who said we can't protect you here. So we had to move once again to a bit further down by the foreshore. And we slept on the ground um, basically all that night. I, I got hardly any sleep, just microseconds, because every time I'd turn around, there would be a big glow on the hill behind me and then that would go out and I think, good, that's under control. And then it would spring up again in another direction. So um, I sort of kept vigil over all these these prostate forms on the ground and I was tuning into the fire truck behind me, trying to pick up snippets of information. But even those guys said that the radio can, the radio um, was not that efficient. They even had trouble finding out what was going on with other fire trucks on the other side of town. So we got through the night and I can remember taking a photograph um, and posting it to Facebook to all the parents of the kids with us and saying, well, we got through the night and isn't that good? And um, at that point, my husband and I sort of crept up to our van, which was parked a little further away. We clambered over all of the belongings that we had um, stacked in there and we got into bed and we might have maybe slept 10 minutes. And then I remember my husband waking up going, oh my God, the plate, the, the, the sky had turned completely orange. And so he said, get out of this. We went back down to, to the water and within minutes, there was this, there was this Armageddon sort of end of world um, experience going on. So the, it was, it was orange, then brilliant red and then black. And I had never heard of this phenomenon. I'd never knew that this could happen as I never knew many things about fire at that stage. I didn't know fire had its own weather system until then. Um, so the black was deeply scary because it, for one thing, it highlighted all the flames around us. Um, and you could, like, even even when it's black in, a, in an Australian night sky, as you probably know, you can, you, can, there's, you can pick out form. You can see there's a few stars. There's nothing. It's just black. Um, and so I happened to be sitting near a Red Cross, a woman from the Red Cross who told me, this is a phenomenon. It happened at Orbost and they were in black. It's called a black. It's, it's going to happen for a few hours. And that sort of calmed me enough. Um, you know, I just sat there and went, yep, this will pass, this will pass, this will pass. And I think I've helped to this great sense of responsibility for these young people around me. Most of them city kids never experienced anything like this. And at some point in that, um, I can't, I'm very hazy about times, but at some point in that time, um, I think perhaps once that black had lifted, we moved. I I, I, um, I happened to uh, run into one of the firemen and he said, what we've experienced so far is just the warm-up act. The worst is yet to come because there was, at that stage, an 80-kilometre wind coming towards us and, and, he, and <clears throat> I could see the fear on his face. So we went back and we moved everybody off the, the ground and onto the jetty and eventually into a borrowed boat. And that's where we just sat out the entire 
ordeal as fires were leaping around us and um, and it was like devil's tongues. That was my description when I wrote for the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, it was every painting I'd ever seen in any art gallery about the end of the world, about doomsday. Um, and what, what, Mary, what were the conversations we among the people? We sat and sat and sat. What were the conversations among the people there waiting for the worst to pass during yeah. those moments sitting in the boat? Very, there were very few conversations because I think um, everybody was just so focused um, on getting through this. There were, there was the odd, you know, joke and whatever, but but most people had their. We had um, towels, sheets, blankets. We had a, we found in our swimming bag some swimming goggles. So I handed them round. So we had goggles. We had these inadequate little surgical masks. We had things over us. Um, and mostly it, people were very inward, just huddling down. Um, there were you know, comments about, did you see that ember? Did you see that fire? Um, but 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 that was that was pretty much it. You know, there wasn't really um, no one no one was up for much um, much conversation at that stage. Later on, <laughs> later on, there was huge anger. But um, with the government, of course. Um, but at that stage, it was just everyone was inward, just pulling yeah. together, <laughs> pulling together to survive the worst. Mary O'Malley, you survived the Malakuta fires. Very pleased to have yeah. you talking to us from the safety of Sydney, your home in Sydney. Thank you very much for joining us here on France Twenty Four. You're very welcome. Now, along with all the damaged land around. 2,000 homes have been destroyed so far. Many of the residents evacuated at incredibly short notice, taking only the essentials. Joining us now from Sydney is a France Van Cats correspondent, Rochelle Harrison Place, who has been covering the fires for us. Rochelle, concretely, where are these people now being uh, welcomed, those who were evacuated at such short notice, who perhaps don't have homes to go back to? Well, there are evacuation centres and relief centres dotted across uh, bushfire-affected regions. These centres have been inundated with donations, uh, food and water and other essential items such as toiletries, even pet food. Uh, we've heard cases of some of these centres having to ask people not to donate any more of these goods because they just don't have the resources to sort through them and therefore uh, they're, instead they're asking for uh, financial contributions, donations uh, um, uh, in that way. Uh, so some people are staying with family and friends. Uh, others are renting uh, temporary accommodation uh, that's uh, been uh, covered by insurance. I spoke to a woman uh, earlier today who, who lost everything, including her, her family home of nearly 10 years. Uh, she's from the town of Batlow, which you may remember made headlines last week uh, when fire authorities said the fire was just unstoppable and therefore the, fa the town was indefensible. Uh, well, she, uh, she said that her family stayed in temporary accommodation that was quickly uh, organised by uh, an evacuation centre in Wagga Wagga, which is about an hour, hour's drive from Batlow. And uh, she also mentioned that up to 800 people from the town of Batlow alone uh, were in the same situation, uh, all being housed in temporary accommodation in the region. Gives you an idea. We, we heard that number earlier, around 100,000 at least displaced more being evacuated over the weekend. Do we have any idea on when they may be able to go back or do these people even want to go back to such bushfire prone regions? Well, that's a complicated question because it depends on the area and also depends on the advice from local authorities. Uh, obviously, residents can't return to their homes until it's deemed safe to do so. Uh, some people have returned uh, to inspect uh, the damage. Others are still waiting. Uh, that woman I spoke to from the town of Batlow, she won't be able to go and inspect uh, the remains of her home until tomorrow. Her husband uh, went to see the house, uh, well, what's left of it, uh, today and and that's a whole week after the fire tore through uh, the village. Uh, now, uh, she said the family has plans to rebuild and said that despite the threat of bushfires, uh, she seems to think that nowhere in New South Wales is safe and that um, she's 
confident that moving forward there will be better strategies put in place. But that's just one family, and obviously um, not everyone has that uh, choice. They have no choice but to go back. Uh, there are families uh, who've lived on the land for generations and have very strong ties to the land. And then there are, of course, uh, farmers uh, who, you know, whose livelihoods uh, can't be moved around at the drop of a hat. Many thanks for joining us, Rochelle Harrison Place. We will indeed be coming back to you for the second half of this special edition of Down to Earth devoted to the Inferno in Australia. Stay with us, though, because we'll be back with you after a quick reminder of the top international headlines. If you're just joining us, you're watching a special edition of Down to Earth here at France 24 on the ongoing blazes burning across Australia. We're looking at some of the poignant images of the past few months as more than 150 fires still burn across the continent. Among the images we've just seen, photos of wildlife engulfed in flames. Australia already has the highest rate of species loss of any area in the world, and researchers fear that rate will only increase as the fire disaster continues. Camille Nedelec brings us this next report. I want to get through and look at this. It's just dozens of animal corpses litter the road. Sheep and cows whose enclosures became death traps when the flames came. Australians are fighting to save as many animals as they can. Ray Harvey saw her own house burn, but remains devoted to caring for wounded kangaroos. Well, your car has insurance. That roo doesn't. You know, and all these people complaining about their houses. Oh, I lost my house too. Who cares? That's what insurance is for. What about their insurance? What about nature's insurance? The land is scarred by the blazes. And Australia's national symbol lies dead on the ground. On Kangaroo Island in the south of Australia, army veterans look after injured koalas who were just too slow to outrun the fires. Their hands are really burnt. Um, some have burnt their noses and their face. They've got a lot of singed fur um, and a lot also have some um, uh, injuries to their lungs from breathing in the really, really um, hot gas from the fires. Volunteers warn that the number of injured animals being handed in to rescue centres is lower than normal, meaning that most may have perished. We've lost millions, as we know, but we don't know if they'll be able to reproduce after this because, as I said, they're already undernourished. That's why we're going to have to support feed in the next few weeks. The University of Sydney estimates that there are 167 animals per hectare, with over 10 million hectares burned. That means the wildfires have killed 1.3 billion animals, often unique to Australia. Four animals out of ten are found nowhere else, as well as koalas and kangaroos. There are many other species. If they disappear from Australia, they disappear, full stop. The wildfires could accelerate the extinction of some species, which would then only exist in captivity. Joining us now from Melbourne, John Wanarski from the Research Institute of Environment and Livelihoods at the Charles Darwin University and Threatened Species Recovery Hub. Many thanks for joining us. John, how would you sum up the impact on wildlife in Australia over the past few months? Yeah, it's been catastrophic and heartbreaking. Many really important conservation initiatives have been subverted in a matter of weeks or months. Many important national parks have burned. Uh, many threatened species, uh, we know that almost the entire um, the extent of their population and range has been obliterated by these fires. It's been devastating. Koalas have been particularly affected, notably in Kangaroo Island. How worrying is this for a species already considered at risk? 
Yeah, no, that's uh, really uh, concerning um, because koalas have an extensive range, but much of that extensive range has been burnt. And koalas just don't cope at all well with bushfires and their recovery rate is very slow. But our concern, you know, that's a charismatic species that uh, has um, clearly um, alerted many in the world to the um, biodiversity costs of these fires. But we're even more concerned about many non-charismatic species whose ranges are really small and those ranges have been entirely encompassed by these wildfire events. Can you give us an idea of what kinds of animals we're talking about, some that may go extinct or may have potentially already? Yeah, there's a ghastly long list of them at the moment. Um, some, for example, are a long-footed potteroo, which a small uh, creature allied to kangaroos that occurs only in the East Gippsland area of southeastern Victoria. Um, really small populations, just a, a few of them scattered around in the forest. And we think that almost all of those uh, populations have now been um, uh, completely killed by these fires. Um, on Kangaroo Island, which you mentioned before, that there's a species of small insectivorous marsupial, the Kangaroo Island dunnart, and almost all of its range is now destroyed by fires. A glossy black cockatoo occurring only on Kangaroo Island. It's entirely dependent on large trees for, for nesting hollows. Um, all of those trees pretty well have been burnt. Um, there's a whole range of species across plants, insects, fish, frogs, reptiles, mammals and birds that we are really have really serious concerns for their future. And just finally, just because the flames have passed through an area doesn't mean, and the animals have survived, doesn't mean that they're, they're in the clear, that their survival is, uh, is a certainty given the, the difficulty in the, the habitat they find themselves in. Alas, you're correct. Um, in many cases, there'll be no food for those animals and they'll do, uh, die a, a very slow death from starvation over a matter of weeks. Um, but there's also many other factors that are compounding the impacts of fires. So after fire, we know that introduced foxes and feral cats prey much more successfully on any surviving wildlife because there's no shelter for them. And we know that um, introduced herbivores, deer, horses, pigs and the like, uh, will graze um, on the few remaining threatened plants that may have persisted after fire. So it's a lot to do after these fires in terms of recovery. Uh, and there's a huge effort that needs to be going to it. Many thanks for joining us, John Winarski from Charles Darwin University and the Threatened Species Recovery Hub. I'd like to welcome Mark Graham, an ecologist with the Nature Con Conservation Council to the conversation. Mark, you're particularly familiar with some of these figures. Could anything have been done to better protect some of these animals? That's a very difficult question, but given the severity the pace, the intensity and the scale of the fires that we've experienced, in many instances there was absolutely nothing that could be done to protect wildlife. These fires are absolutely uncontrollable and are burning on such a scale that some of our greatest expanses of native vegetation have now entirely burnt out and the 10 million or more hectares that has burnt is climbing daily. What this means is that there have already been significant impacts and as John has just said that as John has just said there are likely to have been extinctions and um, following these fire events there are likely to be ongoing declines in species. This situation isn't getting better. This situation is getting worse um, every day and that's truly troubling because Australia is one of the world's most unique areas for its biodiversity. We have a globally unique uh, biota and it's not looking good for so many of our species in our forested areas in southeast and southwestern Australia. And what about the forest specifically? How long will these take to return to their former glory? Many of the eucalypt dominated forests have evolved with fire. So they have particular responses and ways of surviving fire and certain species thrive on fire. But what we're experiencing here in northern New South Wales, where, where I am, about halfway between Sydney and Brisbane, is that some of the most ancient forests on the planet, these very significant Gondwanan rainforests, which have lineages extending way back to before the extinction of the dinosaurs, they have no way of tolerating fire and they've been burning quite extensively. And 
that's likely to lead to an ecological collapse in these areas. And some of the flow-on effects that we've already been experiencing include that when rainfall follows these fires, that rainfall, particularly when there's a, an element of intensity to it, that that rainfall draws ash and charcoal and sediment into streams. And we've seen major uh, impacts upon aquatic ecosystems. And already on the north coast of New South Wales, we've seen major fish kills where catchments have been so heavily polluted by the ash, the charcoal and the, the sediment leaving these fire grounds that all the fish in the, uh, in the, the water bodies, in the streams, have died because there's been no oxygen left within the water body. These are truly troubling events. And these catchments provide drinking water for the vast majority of Australia's population. So we're already seeing major pollution events, and this will have flow-on consequences for people, for agriculture, and right down through to the oceans. There'll be a massive export of organic material from the land and sediment from the land, which then pollutes the marine environment. So I guess, as John was also saying, uh, when the fires are over, that's not it. There are cascading series of consequences from these catastrophic fires. Now, you just touched on the Gondwana Rainforest, a World Heritage listed site. If I understand correctly, you were involved in, in fighting some of the fires there. Is that, is that right? That's correct. So for over four months now, I've been actively involved with community responses to protecting these Gondwanan forests because they're simply not meant to burn. So in particular, I've been working at the Mount Highland Nature Reserve and recently, since before Christmas, in the New England National Park, Gondwana World Heritage Area. And we've actually had some successes. Some of the really significant patches have definitely um, suffered from fire, but through our work in the bushland, so remote bush, bushland firefighting, we've actually been able to prevent fire entering some of the most significant areas of these Gondwanan forests. And hopefully we can keep that, um, we can keep fire out of these areas. Um, in the last five or so weeks, we've probably protected um, some four and a half or 5,000 hectares of Gondwanan rainforest in the New England National Park and in adjoining private properties. So thankfully there will still be some unburnt areas and some of these, uh, these what are supposed to be permanently moist forests will remain and the treasure trove of ancient biodiversity that they contain will hopefully be able to persist because that's mostly why they were listed as world heritage because they are literally amongst the most ancient forested habitats on the planet. Nice way of putting it, a treasure trove of biodiversity. I'd like to thank Mark Graham, an ecologist with Nature Conservation Council, for joining us here on France Van Gap. Now, joining me here on the set now is David Camru, a Franco-Australian associate researcher at Sciences Po and a specialist of South Asia and the Pacific. Many thanks for joining us Southeast here on the set. Southeast Asia and the Pacific. <laughs> thank you very much for being here. First... I'm going to come back to you in a moment, but first we're going to hear from Diptyka Laurent, who's been monitoring the press and social media for us. That's right, um, Marie. You know, there have been wonderful acts of generosity by ordinary citizens in Australia that get much less media attention, so let's not discount that. But it's incredible how beyond uh, the usual thoughts and prayers message, we're seeing a real drive to do something, um, a movement to uh, really led by celebrities, starting, of course, with this simple heartfelt appeal by Celeste Barber, an Australian actress and comedian whose uh, mother-in-law's uh, house was literally in the line of the fires. It started with this, uh, this simple message, please help any way you can. As of today, according to the Australian media, that fundraiser is now the single biggest fundraiser in the history of Facebook, topping 50 million Australian dollars today. Um, a real example of the positive actions of social media. And it's actually, it's interesting, this article here from Perth Now explains that it's a mobilization that's been so grassroots, so um, spontaneous that it, there are even legal issues about how to use that money now because it was initially destined for the rural fire service, uh, 
which means the money is limited. So now lawyers are involved to try and unblock that money so it can go to uh, other strains uh, where, where it's needed, in particular families and reconstruction, uh, so the money can be distributed evenly. And as you mentioned, it was a very simple message, two lines really. It's a surprising cross-section of people, though, who have donated, isn't it? Yeah, and it's been a real snowball effect. I mean, uh, look at the diversity of celebrities. It, um, it shows how global the issue is. Kylie and Danny Minogue, Chris Hemsworth, the Australian actor Nicole Kidman, Elton John, who was in Sydney uh, on, on tour, who uh, donated donated uh, $1 million. The, the, uh, the group Metallica also um, uh, donating money. TV host Ellen DeGeneres. Sports stars like um, uh, Shane Warren, the cricketer who auctioned off a baggy green cap. Uh, Formula One driver Lewis Hamilton. NBA stars have gotten behind this. And you know, in tragedies, you really do see the true nature of people. Um, uh, in particular, Australia's bad boy of tennis, Nick Kyrgios. He's shown incredible leadership, spearheading a campaign to donate money for every ace he serves because we are now in uh, the season of the Australian Open and it's a gesture that's been matched by other tennis players as well now. Many thanks, Dipti. Stay with us because we'll be coming back to you for another recap of some of the social media and press reviews. A lot of the talk has focused on climate change linked to these fires. 2019 was the hottest and driest year on record. The fires fuelled by strong winds, temperatures well above 40 degrees and widespread drought. The country's six hottest days on record were all in December. Uh, in, two in 2019, it, the temperature soared to 49.9 in Nullarbor in the state of South Australia. David, when you hear these numbers, what, what are, what's your immediate reaction? Is this something that we, we could have seen coming? There was a report by the Garnet Commission on Climate Change on Environment in 2008 that predicted in 2020 there would be a major climatic event because of the rising temperatures. So we knew, you know, they, we were warned that this was likely to happen given rising temperatures. Um, it's somewhat bad taste to talk about the polit political ramifications of all this uh, given this uh, ecological disaster. But also in earlier this year, in, I think it was in April, 21 fire commissioners asked to see the Prime Minister to talk about the effects of the drought and the, the potential for a horrendous fire season, and he refused to meet them. It was during the election season. So uh, it is, is having uh, political ramifications, and clearly climate change is now a subject which is being discussed in the pubs everywhere. It's no longer an issue just, you know, to the greenies, to the to the baba cool, as they say in French, uh, the, the bohemians in the, in the suburbs. Uh, but it is something that uh, is being, you know, now it's an existential crisis in Australia. There will be a before these fires and there will be an after these fires. And that won't go away. Now, just to talk about the science behind climate change linked to these fires, I'd like to uh, invite Professor Nerali Abraham from the Centre of Excellence for Climate Extremes from the Australian National University to join us here. Nerali, I'm sure I'm not the first to ask, but what do you answer when people ask Hello. you whether these fires are indeed linked to climate change? Uh, categorically, yes, they are. Uh, what we see um, in Australia for, for bushfires is that climate change has an impact in a number of ways, but particularly through drying out the fuel that's burning in these fires and also increasing the risk of those really extreme fire weather days. Now, Australia's bushfire season normally peaks in January. We've already got several months behind us now. How do we explain this? Yes, so scientists have been warning for a number of decades that one of the, the things that we would see with global warming is that the fire season in Australia would become longer and particularly begin to start earlier. And that's exactly what we've seen play out um, this summer. So the, actually the, the fires started at the end of winter this year and they've burned, they started burning in the southeast of Queensland, um, northern New South Wales, in areas where we have tropical rainforest that wouldn't normally be able to, to burn in the way that it has. Um, and since that time, we've then seen those fires moving um, down southwards towards Victoria as well. And just briefly to end, in your opinion, is this a one-off or is this really a preview of the future? Uh, 
Uh, yes, th this is what we expect um, for climate change and, and one of the impacts that climate change will have um, on Australia. Uh, we've had, the, as you said, the hottest and um, driest year on record in Australia. Um, in the areas that are burning, um, many of those areas have been in severe drought um, since 2017. Um, and one of the, the, the ways that climate change is affecting Australia is that the winter rainfall that we would normally see in the southern parts of Australia, um, that winter rainfall is declining because the, that rain belt is moving further south as the climate warms. Um, and that's a trend that we expect to continue. Um, and really, um, if we want to avoid these fires becoming much worse in the future, what we need to do is to urgently take action to limit further climate change. Thank you very much for joining us, Professor Neralee Abraham. Across the country, as we just heard, there's growing discontent with the government. Tens of thousands of people marched in Australian cities on Friday against the Prime Minister's handling of the crisis. Conservative Scott Morrison is really at the centre of this criticism, demonstrators calling for his resignation. Yinka Oyo today has more. A country in crisis. Thousands flood the streets of Sydney to show their anger against the government. They want concrete action to tackle the bushfires that are crippling the country. This has to stop. We can't keep forgetting and pretending that climate change isn't real and that the planet isn't burning. All the animals are burning and dying. Uh, it's just got to stop. People are pretending it's not true. Politicians are pretending it's not true. Something has to happen. These bushfires were caused by the complete inaction of our government. It's quite sad to see the lives that have been lost have been caused from um, people from our inaction. The prime target of their anger, Conservative Prime Minister Scott Morrison. In spite of mounting pressure against him and calls for him to resign, he seems unmoved. They accuse him of acting inadequately in the face of climate change, which scientists say is at the root of the bushfire crisis. The fact that we're at the bottom of the list of Western countries in dealing with climate change is ridiculous, considering how affluent we are as a country. Thousands also took to the streets in Melbourne and Canberra, two cities that have become some of the most polluted in the world since the start of the bushfires. Joining us again from Sydney is our Australian correspondent, Rochelle Harrison-Pless. The government of Prime Minister Scott Morrison has been widely criticised since the beginning of this crisis. It doesn't appear to be dying down. No, it doesn't. As we saw in that report, uh, massive protests erupted uh, across Australian capital cities yesterday. Tens of thousands of people uh, took to the streets demanding that uh, the Prime Minister be sacked, uh, also calling for immediate climate action and also demanding uh, adequate funding and support for both bushfire victims and volunteer firefighters on the front line. Uh, anger has been growing against uh, the Prime Minister for some weeks now uh, and uh, it's, uh, he's been accused of mishandling the crisis, of, uh, of not uh, sort of showing enough empathy, not showing uh, leadership, of, of being too slow to react. But uh, most of the anger, especially, is against uh, his government's attitude towards climate change and for seemingly downplaying uh, the suggestion that there is any link between, uh, between global warming and uh, the severity of these uh, bushfires. Uh, now, there's been a long list of uh, bad PR moves which have made headlines both here and abroad, starting, uh, starting with uh, that ill-timed vacation to Hawaii when the country was on fire, uh, but also uh, releasing a political party ad during the height of the crisis, uh, forcing a volunteer firefighter to shake his hand when the firefighter clearly didn't want to, uh, and also turning his back on a victim uh, who was asking for help. Uh, but despite all of this criticism, uh, the Prime Minister seem to double down on uh, the government's stance uh, when it comes to climate policy. Uh, the, uh, he's repeatedly rejected changes to Australia's climate policy. He insists that the country will meet and beat its Paris targets. He said he doesn't want any knee-jerk reaction uh, that would, would hurt uh, Australian jobs or the Australian economy, uh, which relies heavily on the coal industry. Uh, in the past, well, in the past, actually as recently as November, he said uh, that uh, uh, there's not enough credible scientific evidence to link uh, the severity of this bushfire crisis with global warming. And that's despite uh, scientists, uh, experts and uh, f fire chiefs, both former and current, uh, saying otherwise. Uh, 
the Prime Minister says uh, Australia is pulling its weight and that it only contributes to 1.3% uh, of uh, global emissions. But critics are quick to point out that actually Australia is uh, one of the world's biggest polluters per capita. Thank you very much for joining us, Rochelle Harrison Place there from Sydney. Now, David, we just heard uh, Rochelle explain some of the, the government's stances. How would you do, describe the government's reluctance to act on climate change? The, the Liberal Party has been torn apart by the question of climate change. They got rid of Malcolm Turnbull, the previous Prime Minister, because he was more uh, receptive to dealing with climate change. There was a Prime Minister before that, Tony Abbott, who was even more climate sceptic than Scott Morrison. So it, it's, it, it's almost a cultural war. Uh, between perhaps the city and the countryside. One of the effects of, the, of these, this disaster may be that the, the schism between the, the, the city and the countryside may, may uh, actually disappear and, and that there will be a joining of forces to, about climate change. Um, and it's always the same mantra, 1.3%. Uh, Is that a reasonable argument? No, it's not a reasonable argument because you add all the not only per capita, Australia is one of the largest polluters, and Second if you after the US. and if you it is also the world's largest exporter of fossil fuels, both gas and 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 coal. So it is a morally bankrupt argument. Uh, however, the prime minister is likely to remain um, unless the party decides that he will be sacrificed, uh, and there will be a coup within the Liberal Party. He's likely to remain in office for for some time. Do you think that what's going on in Australia will have global reverberations uh, around the world? Uh, are other world leaders watching what's happening here to Australia's leaders and the and the. I I think it will, because this is the first time I've heard a climate disaster of this proportion occurring in a rich, developed country. Uh, these were the kind of things, oh, well, that happens in the third world countries, uh, uh, developing countries, uh, you know, they can't deal with this. But here we see a developing country which is incapable of dealing with the problem. Yes, it will have reverberations. We've already seen in world public opinion, uh, especially amongst young people, uh, climate change is a reality. In an opinion poll in Australia, had 75% of those between 18 and 44 saying that climate change was the biggest threat to national right. security. So obviously a lot of global reverberations. Here at Frontline Cat, we will be continuing to monitor these fires. We know that once the fires stop burning, the disaster will not be over. Thank you very much for joining us for that special Down to Earth on Australia's Inferno. Stay, news, stay with us because there's more news and headlines coming up.